Gentlemen, good morning, and thank you very much indeed for sparing time to come and share your thoughts with us on our current uh, investigation and plans for a report on, which is entitled Beyond Brexit, the UK and the Balkans. Um, together, you can add up to enormous expertise in these areas, and the committee has already had circulated to it a, a very extensive number of learned papers. Uh, and indeed a summary by our clerks, extremely helpful. Um, but nevertheless, there's no substitute for uh, verbal expertise and explanation of the kind that we certainly all need. The committee has been visiting this region um, and uh, visited uh, four of the uh, several countries. Um, and um, therefore, obviously, we have a number of our own experiences to test against your observations and your papers. Um, it's going to be a bit of a global tour, uh, because this morning we're looking at, in as far as they can be disentangled, the outside influences of the powers and the world trends on the region, uh, rather than the minutiae of the domestic scene. They're all entangled. We realize everything is woven together, but we'll try, if we can, to come at it from the outside, as it were, and to deal with the various impacts of uh, China, Russia, Turkey, uh, the United States, uh, obviously the EU, NATO, and our own, <coughs> Britain's own interest as it works towards the West Balkans uh, seminar, uh, forum, summit, um, the plan for next year, date yet unspecified, but believed to be sometime in the direction of July. Uh, I should also add formally that um, this is on the record, this session, uh, there are records uh, made of it. Uh, there's an opportunity uh, afterwards for you to see the record of anything you may say <coughs> and wish to alter. So the opportunity is there, but we are on the record. Um, now, I'm going to start um, coming down from the, 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 the global level. Um, I'm going to start on uh, an area which I think 20, 25 years ago hardly came into our consideration, and yet it's coming into the entire consideration of the world now, and that is the growing influence of China. Um, it, we heard a, good, a lot in our visit there about the 16 plus one and the very ambitious Chinese plan, and uh, backed up by vast conferences in Beijing, of course, for development of um, huge infrastructure development, mm. for huge infrastructure projects in the region. Um, so ca can I begin with, um, I'm going to ask for really a volunteer, but I think it's uh, Mr. Matos is probably most li likely to start on how uh, do you see China fitting into the, uh, uh, planning to fit into the area and into the neighboring countries, of course, as well, because this is an East, uh, East and Central Europe generally, and indeed Greece. And how does the West Balkan fit into China's broader economic or political strategy. Why are they interested? Why do we keep hearing references to China on our visit? Should, would you like to start? Yes. But uh, uh, what I want to say is, please, any of you chip in. But I think as we're going to deal with different subjects in which some of you are extreme expertise, we, I'll try and get the, the, the lead on each time to be, lead each time to be with the, with the person who studied that particular area. So China first. and. Um, Mr. McCarthy, you start. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, uh, thank you for, for inviting you're me. I'm sorry, you'll have to speak up. I've got mm -hmm. the acoustics are rotten. Yeah. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, this inquiry, which I think is very timely uh, given, um, uh, given the potential for uh, a governance crisis uh, in, the, in the Balkans. And I think here um, the, the China dimension uh, fits perfectly um, with the concerns about the potential uh, governance issues uh, in the region. Let me firstly start um, with a just short description of the, of the Belt and Road Initiative, um, which China has, has proposed to the world and which the Balkans also form, uh, form part of. Uh, so the Belt and Road Initiative is an initiative of, of the current Chinese leadership uh, to change the domestic economic model of China thanks to the global integration of its economy. This implies uh, building infrastructure, connecting Chinese market with other parts of the world, uh, 
two basically solve uh, two key issues in, in China. One is to export um, over capacity of different Chinese industries, and secondly, to uh, move China up the value chain. Now, through the connections with different markets around the world, China wants to achieve uh, a change of its economic model, but also to redefine its global role. This will have, obviously, uh, enormous geopolitical consequences for every region that China tries to establish to strengthen relations with. This, with the Belt and Road, China is building infrastructure. It's, con it's trying to build new railways connections, uh, maritime uh, routes, uh, ports, but also it invests in uh, creating new links between uh, so-called people-to-people connections. Uh, it also invests in policy coordination with different countries. Now, the Balkans uh, form a crucial part of it because China wants to link uh, its own market with the European market. And the Balkans are perceived as a gateway to it. Um, since 20 2012, China has intensified investments in the Balkans and in, the, in Greece, and firstly starting with a, with a huge investment in, in a port of Piraeus in Greece, which serves as a, as a bridgehead for China to access the Balkans and then also uh, other parts of, of Europe. In the Western Balkans, China tries to build railway connections which are going to link with the port of Piraeus in Greece uh, to Central Europe and then further on to, uh, to the rest of European Union. Uh, this also has to be seen in a perspective uh, this, this is not the only connection that China is trying to build. There are other alternative routes that China wants to develop, notably to Central Asia and Eastern Europe, also on the way to connect to the European Union market. Now, what does it mean for the Balkans? Uh, in the Balkans, given the uh, huge infrastructure deficiency, uh, China's overtures are seen as something extremely positive and which actually may be a boon to the, to the local economies. Since 2012, so the start of, um, of this uh, rapprochement between China and the Balkans, uh, we have seen uh, huge attention paid to, paid to China. This is happening through different vehicles. One is called 16 plus one, uh, which is a, a grouping of, uh, of China with 16 countries of the region, uh, which, which are Central European, European Union member states, uh, but also uh, countries in the Western Balkans. Crucially, China, perceives this region as, as a sort of a contested space. And this is happening since 2012, so the moment of the Eurozone crisis. This, by China, was perceived as a moment for, an, for a strategic opportunity, uh, a moment where it was perceived that because of the crisis in the European Union, the European Union might, st might step down, uh, might, might diminish its commitment to the region. And this will create a, a strategic opening for China. Since 2012, China has moved on with uh, lavish funds, with uh, political engagement, uh, establishing, uh, establishing close political links with, with the leadership of, of the countries in the region, and has also offered uh, uh, substantial funding for infrastructure and also promised uh, investments. Okay. I think what we have to see, um, now what, what, what does it mean for us, uh, for the European Union and, and especially for the United Kingdom? Um, we have to uh, see it in a, in, a, in a context. China is a, is a relatively new player in the region. Uh, it starts from a very low base, but the dynamic is extremely uh, fast. Um, in a way, China competes with us, but at the same time, uh, there is a quite a substantial collaborative dimension of, of China's, China's relations with the, with the region. In terms of competition, um, the key issue here is that uh, China brings with, it, with itself its own investment model with every infrastructure project, there comes a new set of rules uh, which are um, part and parcel of the Chinese own domestic economic model. Those rules are related to um, closed uh, or the lack of uh, public procurement tendering. That means that uh, projects are awarded directly by politicians to uh, their preferred companies. Um, Chinese companies often um, operate um, uh, in with less, uh, with less um, attention paid to, uh, to standards of corruption. And uh, they also operate uh, with uh, lower transparency standards. This all contributes to undermining of the governance reforms that we have been promoting in the, in the Balkans. But it's also this collaborative uh, dimension of, uh, of China's approach in the region, which is in the, in the region such as Balkans, which has not been a prime investment uh, location. I think this is positive that we see this, um, this new attention from an external investor 
especially such a formidable one as China, which is now the second biggest economy in the world. Now, this should be welcomed, but we have to work with China in a way that addresses all the different concerns and, and the deficits of the Chinese investment model so that we get the best of, of, its, uh, of its attention to the region, but we mitigate the potential risks, the, which I mentioned relate to the, to, the, to the investment model of China. Ms. Gerson, on the finance mm -hmm. side, are we talking about so pure Chinese finance, um, or I noticed in the Beijing, the last Beijing conference on Obor, they began talking about raising money from the countries through which they were going to build their infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And that may be just for Central Asia, but is, is the pattern that China arrives in these mm -hmm. areas with, with real money, with real finance? Mm -hmm. or may I chip in on the question? Yes, okay. please. Uh, uh, on that particular issue, it's of interest that I'm just back yesterday from an economist conference on Eurasia, Russia, China that took place in Athens. And the thing that struck me was uh, on this uh, great initiative of theirs, One Belt, One Road, apparently the annual sum of money involved in these projects in this whole area covered by it is one trillion dollars. One trillion dollars, that is absolutely oh, astonishing. So the money that goes into the Balkans from this is actually a drop in the ocean, talking a few billion. It's not even on their radar screen. The number two person involved in this walked up to me at the conference and I started talking to him about China, Balkans, China, <coughs> Serbia, and he knew nothing about it. It was just such a small aspect, but nevertheless, a small amount of money, relatively small amount of money, goes a long way in the Balkans. So Serbia gets about half of it. Uh, estimates are about five to six billion in contracts. But the important thing is this is all in the form of loans. Hardly anything is in form of foreign direct investment. Ah. There's only one significant foreign direct investment, which is the Smederevo Steelworks, used to be owned by U.S. Steel the Chinese came in and staged it. So it's of some significance. But everything else is loans, which is also one of the reasons for some reservations in the region amongst analysts about the money, because even though, as was mentioned by Mr. Makotsky, the leaders of the region welcome it, and why shouldn't they, you know, it's additional money, there are some reservations. First of all, the increased debt that accompanies it because it's loans, not foreign direct investment. Loans are usually not accompanied by technology transfer, unlike foreign direct investment. Workers groups are quite unhappy also. Interestingly, the Smedrev or Steelworks, the workers' unions, are quite unhappy about how they're being treated uh, by the Chinese. And also one of the reasons for this model of the Chinese is to gain a work for construction for Chinese uh, companies and workers, and this is something that's not that popular. So there's a, there are some caveats, but in direct answer to your question, it's mainly loan finance, and the sums involved in the scheme of things are relatively limited, though they're not insignificant from the perspective of the Balkan recipients. Thank you very much. Baroness Harris. Uh, uh, just a quick question, if I may. You said that we should welcome Chinese investment. Would you be able to let me tell the, the committee where in the world Chinese investment produced positive outcomes in terms of transparency, fighting corruption, developing uh, good governance, and strengthening of the institutions? Mm -hmm. um, I mentioned that we should welcome Chinese investment um, under the conditions that they comply with our rules um, in the Balkans. Are we in a position to put conditions um, on the investment during the Balkans? Uh, we should be then supporting the structural, structural conditions <coughs> in the countries, especially those uh, which are in, um, uh, which have applied for the membership in the European Union, where we have uh, quite important policy levers in the accession process. We should, within this accession process, uh, we should actually incorporate specific China-related goals. You know, China will stay in the region, and those, the leaders of those countries will be interested in Chinese money, regardless of what we, what we pay them. We should then work with them to establish the rules which will allow them to, or the societies in those countries, to actually reap the benefits of the Chinese investment. Now, those rules should be uh, related within the accession process to public procurement standards, to transparency issues, also to the debt uh, sustainability, 
and, uh, and also broader to uh, fighting of corruption. When we manage to establish those rules, then we have a greater potential uh, for the Chinese investments to actually bring positive effects. Without working with those countries to improve those conditions, China will simply be there and will be offering um, those investments with all the potential negative uh, consequences. Okay. Sorry, can I give maybe yes, a please, slightly please, different please. answer on this? Uh, two points, I'd say. It's a little bit like the pot calling the kettle black. When you talk about standards of transparency and so on, the idea the EU companies are paragons of this stretches belief. You know, you can just have a few examples. Some of the main EU investments in the region, like the Fiat plant in Serbia, is totally non-transparent. Contracts are secret, the content. Uh, local journalists recently investigated the nature of EU investments there. The subsidies, the corruption involved, really it is quite astonishing. So the idea that somehow China is the only bad guy <coughs> stretches belief. The second point I would make is in terms of the attitude to Chinese investment. Britain, post-Brexit, I think should be an open, in my view, an open economy and welcome and not be protectionist. At the moment, the EU is advocating very protectionist measures towards uh, Chinese investment, screening it under the guise that these uh, investments that threaten national security. In my mind, this is just an excuse for protectionism, and UK post-Brexit should not take part in it. And if you don't believe me, you should read uh, uh, Mr. Juncker's statement justifying this. It is quite stunning. In, in terms of its protectionist yes. intent towards Chinese investment, and yes. this is something I don't think UK should participate. I just want to add one other point uh, in answer to your question, which of course you, we've analyzed some of the complications that come with Chinese investment, but the reality is that if China wasn't willing to put its money into some of these big infrastructure mm. projects, nobody would be, mm. and the Balkans would not have the new railroads, ports, roads, factories, and, and you know, other investments which the Chinese are currently making. Sorry. Same goes for Africa, if I may. Yeah, yeah, uh, indeed. Yeah. Yeah, could you tell us what you, you think is the Russian uh, um, attitude to China's aspirations, which you've been explaining to us? Because <laughs> an awful lot of the transport links uh, involve um, going through the Russian sphere of influence, whether it's in the uh, uh, Can I just say, Lord Dr. Economics, Economics, we want to come on to Russia. I see your thought about well Russia it's and China, it, it, it's so it's linked, but it um, would be nice if we could just tie up the complete China scene and then come on to Russia, but... Um, um, well, I could put it the other way around. Mm -hmm. um, do you think the Chinese are likely to be impeded in any way in, in developing their um, infrastructure projects uh, by interference <coughs> and ob objections from the Russian sphere of influence. Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah. Any volunteers? Well, again, I will appeal to this conference I just attended. It was quite evident the Russians were pretty sour and unhappy. And I think it's a good question you put. I wouldn't be at all surprised. They do not welcome this, I That's have right. a strong feeling. And I say on the sort of human contact, you could see that they were quite resentful also of the pride of place the Chinese were given, and why shouldn't they? Chinese are bringing the money. Yeah. Russians are not bringing it. That's right. yeah. money. So in places like you know, Kazakhstan, which is very close to Russia, and the Kazakhstanis are welcoming this Chinese initiative, you can, I could imagine, though I have no proof of this, but I could just imagine sort of behind the scenes pressure from Russia not to get too cozy a relationship with China. Can I just make a, make a point here? Yes, there was, there was a time about 10 years ago when, Ruff, when Russia saw itself as the east-west link. Mm. Uh, for, their, for them, the Chinese are a rival. They're taking their, they're taking their lunch away from mm. them. Yeah. Well, well, we'll come back to Russia in a moment. Just to sum up this before we move on. Well, we're saying that, first of all, this is loan finance. This is not comparable with 
with uh, aid in the American or British sense. And I think it was the Washington think tank this morning pointing that out. Mm -hmm. They're clearing up the area of the debt. And secondly, it seems to be the opinion that nevertheless, Britain and British business should seek to work with these vast projects in a reasonably mm -hmm. positive way. Is that, have we got that right? Yeah, let me maybe also, firstly, let me actually uh, confirm um, what has been said before, but also correct um, uh, some, of, some, some other approaches. Uh, firstly, yes, this is based, China's approach is based on lending. It's based on lending, which also transfers the risk of all the different projects onto the recipient countries. Now, I think we should be very careful with the numbers that China is mentioning, such as trillion dollars. Um, this is part of a Chinese sort of, you know, soft power attempt to convince uh, that its initiative is realistic and it's based on some you know, fundamentals, um, and it's actually based also or, or uh, backed up with, with substantial funds. This is not always the case. Most of the Chinese lending throughout different regions that China engages has been based on lending. And especially in the Balkans, this has actually fueled uh, indebtedness of those, of those countries. Uh, we have seen, for example, in Montenegro, just one single project which mm -hmm. amounted to a quarter of Montenegro's GDP. It's a, it's a, uh, it was a loan also uh, established mm -hmm. in US dollar, which meant that with the currency exchange rate, suddenly the amount of loan has increased by 25% to, to Montenegro. Now, IMF and World Bank has already engaged all the countries in the region on the issue of Chinese lending. Uh, Serbia has also become extremely cautious in taking up other uh, projects from China because of a warning from IMF that its uh, indebtedness is already reaching ceilings. Uh, now the Serb Serbian government, and throughout my research trips in the region, I have talked to uh, uh, advisors to the prime minister uh, on, on infrastructure. They also are extremely cautious about making use of, of Chinese money. However, they're trying to find other ways, other modalities to engage Chinese, Chinese funding. And for example, there is this um, well-advertised uh, project of connecting Belgrade to Budapest, which is raising a number of concerns, including in the European Union, because of the Chinese investment model, which might stand in contravention to the European Union law. Now, there is a lot of uh, noise around this project, and uh, people describe, this, describe it as a high-speed railway project, while in reality, it's a conventional speed project. People also make assumptions that the entire project will be financed and executed by China, while in reality, so far, only a very small portion of 40 kilometers has been awarded to China, and the rest of the, of, the, of the project, another 40 kilometers, has actually been executed by Russian companies, while the rest of the, of the line is still under, under discussion. Why it has happened like this? Because Serbian government is also becoming very cautious about Chinese money, and it was willing to grant to China on a very small part of this, of this project. This is supported by the Ministry of Finance of, of Serbia, but other political interests are in, in, in the play. Now, that is why I mentioned that those countries will be making, taking advantage of Chinese money, but we should try to engage them as quickly as possible to make sure that they actually are supported, you know, any parts of the society or the government which have a rational approach to Chinese, Chinese money, so we should support them through all the different ways and means, including the accession uh, and enlargement process. Yeah. Okay, well now, that's a fascinating mm -hmm. issue, but I think we must move on. Uh, mm -hmm. Lord Reed, we'll start on another. Uh, yes, from, from China, which is, as you said, relatively new in the area, to Turkey, which is not relatively new. I think it's probably uh, Dr. Les and Dr. Taylor I would initially address the question to. I have made a, a chairman's mistake. We are actually one moving straight on to Russia first. Okay. Uh, it, well, a general Sorry. question to begin with, really, about uh, uh, Russian uh, involvement in the, in the Western Balkans. We've had some evidence to suggest that um, uh, this is sometimes uh, exaggerated, uh, maybe for the, uh, uh, for the benefit of negotiations with the, uh, with the West by some leaders in the Balkans, and that uh, in any event, um, uh, Russian involvement is not nearly as extensive as is sometimes characterized. I mean, would anyone like to uh, uh, comment on that? Sure. Approach to the region, I would use um, three, um, well, R Russia's approach to the region is based on several principles. First of all, it's pragmatic. They are uh, eager and able to work with anyone, regardless of political affiliations, 
regardless of ethnic affiliations. Of course, they have certain preferences, but the approach is primarily pragmatic. It is opportunistic. It takes advantage of what's happening on the ground. Um, you may hear different theories about grand Russian strategy to the region, but it's difficult to um, confirm it through the existing evidence. Russia's approach to the region is reactive. It's not very constructive. They do not offer new different opportunities that would contrast with the European Union or NATO. It's more of a critical, more of a um, uh, approach where the, the, the basis is um, criticizing the, the, the existing Western, Western models. Um, and it's flexible. Depending on the situation, Russia has the flexibility to change its approach, to change, its, to change the players that it supports um, on the ground. So I would say that Russia's strength in the Western Balkans lies primarily in its ability to exploit opportunities through a mixture of pragmatism, flexibility, and opportunistic um, approach. Uh, as I said, it's primarily reactive. It's not very constructive. Um, to answer your question directly, one of Russia's priorities is to create a projection of Russia as a great power. That Russia is, a, that Moscow is one of the capital cities in the world that is on the same level as Washington, as Beijing. Um, therefore, it's always, um, th th it's always a challenge to underestimate Russian approach. And I think when it comes to Balkans, Western leaders have very often underestimated what Russia is actually doing there. But at the same time, uh, it's, uh, Russia should not be overestimated in a sense that what Russia wants us to believe is that it's bigger than it really is, that its involvement in the region is bigger than it really is. So there's a fine balance <coughs> in between what Russia is actually doing, what, what, what we think it's doing, and the projection that it, it has on the region. Um, in terms of flexibility, Russia's approach was changing uh, with different events. Um, one, one might argue, going back to the history, but let's focus on relatively recent historical events. The um, Ukrainian-Russian gas spat in 2006, when Russia cut the gas supplies for, uh, for Ukraine, this had significant influence on, on Russian um, interests, in energy interests in Southeast Europe. This is where South Stream, Russia's pipeline initiative, uh, appeared as a, possible as a possible transit route that could bypass the existing pipeline systems. This is one example of, of Russia's pragmatic and flexible approach. The second thing is Kosovo's recognition. Mm. Russia was verbally supporting Serbia throughout the conflict in the 1990s, but in reality, there, 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 wasn't, there wasn't much direct action. After the recognition of Kosovo in 2008, Russia re-engaged directly with Serbia again, trying to play the role of its bigger brother and biggest supporter on the issue of Kosovo. And the third example I would give is the Ukraine crisis, 2013-2014. This is, in a way, a turning point in Russia's approach to the region. Ever since then, Russia looks at contacts with the West more in terms of a conflict, maybe a too strong word, but in terms of West being an oppo opponent. And Balkans is very often uh, described as uh, EU's soft underbelly. This is where um, Russia seeks opportunities to exploit differences, to play on the anti-Western card, to use it in its uh, relations with West to undermine Western model in the region, to undermine Western achievements in the region, such as Dayton, such as Kosovo, to give, to give two examples. So this the, 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 the it's difficult to give a direct answer, therefore, to your question whether Russia's um, political influence is overestimated or underestimated. I would say there is a fine balance in between, and it's more reactionary, reacting to the events rather than creating them. I would give you a direct answer. In my view, its uh, answer is much ado about little, that it is overestimated. Uh, if you look at it in terms of economically, in trade and investment, it is so small, it's five, six percent of these countries trade and investment compared to the EU, a very small player. Okay, it's trying, as was said, opportunistically to fill a vacuum, which is, to be fair, been created by the EU. The enlargement perspective is almost, frankly, finished as it, things stand today. So Russia's trying, just like China before we talk, fill a vacuum there. In terms of its political influences, okay, it leverages to a certain extent 
some historic and cultural ties with the Slavic populations there. Uh, it leverages very much Kosovo. I wouldn't underestimate that. Okay, they didn't help Serbia in the 90s, but uh, Russia is crucial along with China and some other countries in blocking UN membership for Kosovo, in blocking rec universal recognition. So this is the main card, really, that they play with Serbia. But when you look at Russia's influence in the whole region, let's not forget they suffered some immense setbacks recently. Montenegro's membership of NATO, Montenegro, is meant to be a traditional ally. I mean, this was a big blow, and in a sense, Russia, there was nothing they could do about it. Pence visited Montenegro. Uh, Macedonia, where they were trying to stir up trouble and back Ruevsky very strongly. This was an incredible setback, Social Democrats returning to power. So if you look at the region, the only area where you could say arguably they really have strong influence is the Republic of Srpska, Bosnia and Serb Republic. And even there, Dodik is really effectively more reliant on Serbia than he is on Russia. And even in Serbia, Serbia is trying to play a sort of old Titoist game of balancing Russia against the West, and why not? Small countries tend to do that. So Serbia is not clearly pro or anti-Russian, and certainly is not going to join EU sanctions uh, against Russia, but at the same time, it's committed to EU membership still. Its new prime minister is very strongly pro-Western. It's got into a bit of trouble by downplaying Russia's role. So that's where Russia's position stands. And my final comment, which I'm sure the chairman will want to come back to afterwards. When we talk about we, I'm not sure who we're talking about. You know, you talk about we, and one of the other witnesses was talking about we, EU, UK. Well, to me, this is not a we any longer. Remember, the UK is leaving the EU. One should talk separately about UK policy post-Brexit. It is no longer the same thing. Does, EU. Does, does that give us new opportunities to I deal think more so. directly rather than go through the labyrinth of Brussels? Absolutely, I think so. And I don't know if Lord Howell remembers, we were together at a conference in Greece about 12 years ago where this point was made, British Greek society. I think it does give opportunities, uh, even though Britain doesn't have many trade and investment links with the region, it has certain historic ties, it has a big advantage of English language, its role in NATO, cultural diplomacy, educational ties, and unencumbered by a certain uh, you know, EU view of the region, I think it actually gives uh, considerable opportunities for the UK to play an important role, which hopefully will become also evident with the conference uh, next year on the Balkans. Um, any more on Russia? Yeah, would, uh, no, go, can you just want to continue? Please. Yeah, I, do. I would like to ask another question, but I think Dr. Lee was about to... Uh, sure. Uh, um, yes, thank you. I, I would endorse a great deal of what Mr. Kekic, Mr. Kekic just said there. J just to answer your question directly, you asked whether um, the influence of Russia has been overestimated and whether some local politicians were using this as leverage against the West. And I think uh, the short answer to that is certainly yes. Uh, and it's particularly true of those parts of the Balkans uh, which are only weakly exposed to Russia, such as Albania, Kosovo, where I think there's pretty strong evidence that local leaders uh, are exaggerating the threat from Russia in order to shock the EU and uh, revive the stalled process of enlargement. And I would just make one other point, um, which is that uh, Russia's inherent capacities are limited in the Balkans, uh, and, and I will go on to make the same point about Turkey as well. These are not big hitters in the region, but the reason they have any influence at all is because of the power vacuum that's opening up uh, as a result of the uh, breakdown of the EU enlargement process and the diminishing authority of the West. And this means that Russia is able to leverage um, grievances in the region, such as the dispute over the final status of Kosovo, um, uh, the uh, crisis in Macedonia, which unfolded last year, and also I would really emphasize uh, 
the determination of the Bosnian Serbs to make a drive for independence, uh, uh, which Russia is backing. Um, and because Russia is championing these causes, it has influence over states using minimal effort and, and with minimal resources behind it. Just as a, a, a follow-up, really, um, <clears throat> uh, and maybe this is too big a question to ask, but it, it's really along the lines of the view from the Western Balkan, uh, Balkans um, towards A, involvement by uh, Russia, and B, involvement by, quote, the West, unquote, so that, that the, the sentence is a generalised this, because, I mean, inevitably, as viewed from the West, if Russia's doing things in the Western Balkans that's regarded as interference. Um, uh, if the West is uh, doing things in the Western Balkans, that's regarded as constructive engagement. I mean, I suppose that, uh, th that is almost inevitable, isn't it? Uh, but uh, uh, you probably can't generalise about the views um, from the Western Balkans towards, the, uh, uh, towards in involvement from outside. Um, but I'd be interested to see if you willing to make any observations on that. Well, that's absolutely true. Uh, <laughs> if you're a country which is in conflict with the West, uh, and we can go back to the ones I just mentioned, the Serbs are in dispute, Ser Serbia, I should say, is in dispute over the status of Kosovo. The Bosnian Serbs over their uh, status in Bosnia, and the Macedonian government, which recently fell, was under immense pressure to resign from the United States and other uh, Western governments uh, and for a period of nearly two years was holding out in the face of massive diplomatic pressure to resign. So I don't think we should run away with the idea that, <laughs> which you've alluded to, that everything coming from the West is seen as cooperation and everything coming from the East is interference or manipulation. Uh, another um, example is this obsession with Russian... Uh, interfering, so-called fake news that it's interfering in local political processes, putting out false information, so-called big role for Russian media outlets like Sputnik and Russia Today. Well, even that has to be, I think, taken with a pinch of salt. If one looks at the Western Balkans, even though organizations like Sputnik is undoubtedly present, again, pales into insignificance given the Western ownership of all the main media <coughs> outlets, newspapers, of the role of Radio Free Europe. It's very small. If we look at uh, political influence in these countries, again, in a country that you think might be receptive, like Serbia, only something like 10 to 15 percent of the members of parliament are members of parties that are obviously pro-Russian. So their ability to influence events in the region and the media influence Again, I would argue is vastly exaggerated. Uh, Lord Taylor, uh, sorry, Dr. Taylor wants to get in. Yeah. Well, I can, I can follow up that one by saying that yeah, that it's interesting to look at the kind of political parties that, that do lean towards Russia. Mm. And, and, and I'd have trouble naming one that is actually in government in any any of the Balkan countries. I probably you probably hadn't said that. You can probably find one example. But well, it's, it's, probably it's, 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 it's quite yeah. it's quite quite low. Uh, you know, and most of the most of the parties that Russia is, is engaging mm. with are minority parties, extremist parties. Nobody's going to go into government with them, so that their influence politically is quite low. I was just going to sort of um, em underline an earlier point about the opportunism. I think that's a weakness from Russia's point of view. And we look back at the Macedonian example; they did take up the West view. In fact, mm. Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, actually came out and said the West is intervening in, in, in Macedonian affairs. It's outrageous. It's not. Well, he's now in opposition. Where, you know, where, 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 are the, where is their influence now? And, and the, the, the Social Democrats can say, well, the Russians have picked their side. Yeah. Well, okay, you're not, you know, we're, okay, we're now on the other side now. We're, we're, we're to do with this. And remember the South Stream uh, debacle? Mm. Well, I, I consider it a debacle. Mm. When Putin, of his own unilaterally, said, South Stream, finished. All these Balkan countries, like Bulgaria in particular, were saying, you know, we're really interested in the South Stream. We're going to get this. It's going to do us a lot of good. And he just comes and turns up, in, I think, in Turkey, and just it's over now. And that seemed to be a sort of fit of pique because the EU was applying its rules about um, competition against the Gazprom's uh, pipeline and whether Gazprom would have to admit other people to use the pipeline. 
And well, well they know. I mean, they've, they've revived Turkstream. We still don't know whether Turkstream is going to end at the Turkish Greek border and whether it's going to go any further into Europe. Nobody knows. I mean, what, you know, it's, I think, I think the, Turk, the Russians are always shooting themselves in the foot. Uh, Charles Wisniewski, you wanted a word on, on this before we move on? Yes, um, just, just one thing concerning the, the issue of the media, because it's one of the, the hot topics, and whenever one is trying to find evidence of Russian involvement in the region, they, so they, they look my, mainly at soft power and um, strategic communication or propaganda, however, you want to, however, however one, wants to, uh, one wants to label it. Going into the example of, of Sputnik and its underplay, I mean, the, 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 the actual reach of Sputnik is difficult to estimate, that is true. But if one looks at other media outlets, um, they usually put sources, put information based on a certain source. Like, for example, Reuters is one of the most famous, obviously, news agencies. One of the main sources of news agencies in, the, in Serbia in particular, also in Republika Srpska, also in Montenegro, is Sputnik. So you can look at the um, respected or considered as respectable media outlets in the Balkans when you look at the source of the information, very often, not always, but very often, it's Sputnik because it's one of the very few agencies in the region that has uh, a large number of correspondents or stringers, local stringers. When you look at Western media, you have a limited number of Western media stringers, Western media correspondents working in the region. This creates a certain disbalance. And you can look at various studies done by academics who are looking actually at Russian strategic communication it's not to say that all of the communication coming from RT or Sputnik is propaganda. That's not what these academic studies are saying. But they are saying that very often there are certain narratives, very often there are certain ex ex experts who present a point of view that is more favorable to Russia, that Russia prefers, rather than the West. Say, presenting the events in Ukraine from the Russian perspective, rather than from the perspective of other countries in the region looking at the events in Kosovo from the perspective of favorable to Russia or Serbia, rather than different actors in the region. And um, this is something that's very difficult to quantify. It's difficult to estimate the actual numbers because no one is releasing the actual numbers as to how many people view uh, Sputnik, how many people open the websites of Sputnik. Yeah. But when you look at the evidence that's out there, that's available, I mean, this is a fact. Very often, this is the main source of misinformation. In the region. Uh, just a very quick addition to this, if I may, very uh, quick Perfect. one. Well, you know, heaven forbid they should uh, be representing the Russian point of view. Have you watched CNN recently, perhaps? So, you know, the, B the, BB the BBC for that matter. But the main point I wanted to make was that in terms of, uh, you know, people's uh, perceptions in this region, they're really knocking at an open door and they don't have to do much. If you look at Serbia, the two things that obviously affects uh, the vast majority of Serbian view of the situation is the NATO intervention in 99 and the recognition of Kosovo as independent state. So the Russians really don't have to be arguing, engaging in fake news. They can rely on this race, recent history in terms of the influence on the perceptions of the people. Yes, very quickly, because we can't, we can't uh, move on. I've been alerted to one, uh, one public opinion poll in Serbia uh, where Russia actually was perceived as a number one aid provider to Serbia, mm. which is far, far from being true. Same goes about China's involvement, which I described also about this high-speed project, which is not high-speed. And also, I think even Mr. Tecic's uh, quotation of some numbers pertaining to China's involvement mm. in the region also complicates this picture because, in reality, the combined funding from the European Union, from individual Western donors and international financial institutions are much higher than any offer from China, mm -hmm. and as we also discussed, are based on grants rather than on lending. Now, we should not underestimate ourselves. And I think, you know, all the discussion about Russia's or China's influences in the region has to be always in the context of how little we have achieved mm -hmm. so far and whether we should actually step up our mm -hmm. offer to the, to the region. And let me also come back to the discussion on uh, UK post-Brexit, post you know, of, uh, and also to counter a bit this upbeat tone about uh, opportunities that Brexit provides uh, United Kingdom in the Balkans. I think that the most important lever in the region is and will be an accession process. Even if this is not now on the cards in the short term, the whole agenda of engagement through the European Union, with which UK 
has been able and is still able to influence, it gives the United Kingdom much more influence on the policy making in the region than will be, will be the case after, after Brexit. Now, UK should not also, um, uh, should not forget about this lever, even after Brexit, it is able to have this cooperative approach with the European Union and actually work together there. I don't think that United Kingdom will ever be able to match either the kind of engagement from the European Union, the level of funding from the European Commission, or even the level of investments and trade coming from Germany and other countries. Now, this would position the United Kingdom in a very collaborative uh, spirit towards, uh, towards collaboration with the, with the other uh, partners in the, in the region. Yes. Well, we want to come back to this in, uh, more in a moment. Uh, Lobel, did you want to come in on this, on the Russian thing? Did I see your hand move? No. 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 Well, I, well, I think there's much more to ask on Russia, but perhaps we could now move on to Turkey. I apologize for my premature call, Lord Lee. But uh, um, now let's, let's turn to the Turkish comeback of this good call. Yes. Um, how is Turkey perceived across the region? Um, is it possible to discern where Turkey's focus is? And is it possible to discern a strategic intent? I mean, we heard that Russia is a combination of opportunism, pragmatism, mm -hmm. and so on. So it's really two questions. How, how, how are they perceived by the region itself and what is their strategic intent and focus in the region? <coughs> well, well, like start. Yes, certainly. Um, I think the short answer is that peoples of the region hold strong views about Turkey, both positive and negative. Is that based on historical appreciation, the Ottoman Empire, and so on and so forth? I think that, that certainly shapes perceptions, but I think Turkey's behavior in the present day uh, is also a major determinant of how it's seen. I mean, the most, um, the contrast could be seen most clearly in Bosnia, uh, which is a country uh, comprised of three constituent peoples. Uh, and among the, the Bosniak population, the Bosnian Muslims, uh, Turkey is seen uh, very positively. Uh, about three quarters of the, 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 the Bosniak population cite Turkey as their favorite country in the world. Uh, and this has a lot to do with uh, certainly a common Islamic heritage, uh, the support that Turkey gave uh, the Bosnian government during the war, and then more recently, uh, the support which uh, Turkey has given the Bosniaks in their dispute with Bosnian Serbs and Bosnian Croats. And then by contrast, uh, precisely because of the support which Turkey has given to the Bosniaks, uh, the Bosnian Serbs see Turkey as a hostile power, and then that plays into uh, you know, an inherited memory of discrimination and so on from the Ottoman period. And out, outside yeah. of, uh, I can understand yes, that yes. in the 90s and so on, but outside of Bosnia. Outside of Bosnia. Uh, so in the wider... You have a range of views. Uh, you could say as a generalization that the perceptions of Turkey are more positive in countries with an Islamic heritage, Albania, Kosovo, but uh, you can't say that everyone in those countries is universally uh, supportive of, of Turkey's role. It, there's certainly, you know, it depends uh, on your, um, your class status and your educational background. It's a very nuanced uh, views which people will have, particularly since their primary loyalty is towards the West. Okay, and, and, and Turkey's strategic intent? Or Turkey's strategic intent, focus? well, uh, I think the first thing to say is that Turkish politics is in a state of extreme flux at the moment, uh, and therefore whatever you might say about Turkey's strategic intent right now may not apply a couple of years in the future, but with that caveat in mind. So it's not consistent like the President of the United States? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, a, a great deal is changing, uh, and I can't even be sure that, uh, you know, by the start of the next decade, that Turkey will definitely support the integration of the Western Balkans into the EU, for example, and I cannot be sure that what Turkey's relationship with NATO is going to be 
uh, and by extension what it wants for the Western Balkans. Um, but I think to the extent that there are constants, and, and you're asking the question, uh, in the political sphere, so Turkey certainly sees the Balkans as part of its um, sort of historic sphere of influence, and it wants to project power there uh, to demonstrate that it is a great power. It certainly wants stability in the Balkans because this is its land corridor uh, to Western Europe. And then I think in the realm of security, it doesn't want a hostile power gaining a foothold in the Balkans. That power may be Russia in the future, keeping in mind that it has this strategic alliance with Russia now. And nor does Turkey support separatism in the Balkans, which would potentially set a dangerous precedent for the Kurds. How would it regard the, before we, sorry, yeah. I pointed up to, uh, how would it regard the EU, I mean, Turkey's a member of NATO, may, you know, change in the future, um, and it technically, I suppose, still has a relationship with the European Union seeking accession, though that looks, yes. you know, further away. So, if it regards Russia as a potentially uh, hostile competitor in the area for strategic power, how does it regard the European Union? Well, this is one of those issues which is in a state of flux at the moment. Right. I think if you'd asked me the question at the end of last decade, I would have said that Turkey was reasonably well disposed towards the EU, and it was certainly had, you know, it was locked into the accession process, and, and probably most people would have said its ultimate destiny was to join the EU. Mm. But things are changing, uh, and uh, mm. relations with Germany and Austria are desperately strained at the moment. Mm. Uh, and I think it's probably a safe bet to say that Turkey will not now join the EU. Uh, and, and, and so this has implications for what Turkey would like to happen to the Western Balkans. Uh, hitherto, it probably took the view that Turkey and the Balkans would all join the EU together, and that was the way in which it could project power and influence over the region. But if Turkey is not now going to join the EU, it may decide that the best way to exert hegemony is for the Balkans to be outside of the EU and then uh, you know, creating a sort of open field for Turkey. I was going to say that um, flux is probably one word for describing Turkey at the moment. Um, it's a divided country. Uh, well, several other countries around the world are also highly divided, but highly heavily polarised between people who think er Erdogan could walk on water and people who think Erdogan is the devil. Um, e even within his own party, which has um, came to power, a large element coming from business people wor uh, in central Anatolia, those people have done well out of the EU, out of the customs union. And you'll get contradictory statements, even from within the ruling party about the, and the government. Erdogan himself, I think it's abundantly clear, he despises Europe. Um, he thinks that Europe is, is um, hypocritical, Islamophobic, um, he doesn't see the, what, you know, he, he doesn't admire Europe and the way that Seoul said Ataturk and the people who came after Ataturk did. I think the whole, the whole sort of um, tendency of Turkey is moving away from the West now, led by Erdogan. Not that everybody wants to be, get on that particular train. A lot of people still think that the West is where Turkey belongs. So you've got this kind of, um, it's difficult to make a sort of general statement about Turkey wants this, Turkey wants that. You've got different, different strands within Turkey as within many other countries in the world. I would talk about the way to look at it, I think, again. I mean, one thing I, perhaps I would say is, of course, as we speak, uh, Erdogan is in Serbia. Yes. So you, these, these things are in flux. Mm, yeah. I think, I think Erdogan has realized that actually the policy they followed for a long time in the near, near past which we could link to a man called Ahmed Davutoglu, mm. who was foreign minister and then prime minister until mm. 2016. Mm. He wrote this book called Strategic Depth, where he was talking about a kind of a kind of neo, it's called neo-Ottomanism, which may or may not be accurate, I don't know. But it's kind of where, let's, let's go back to sort of our various links we have mm. from the past with countries which used to be part of the Ottoman Empire. And it seemed to be unrealistic and it seemed to regard these countries as almost having a nostalgia the Ottomans that actually the Turks had, but not other people yeah. on the whole, apart from the, the Bosniaks, as, as Timothy mentioned. Yeah. Um, 
So I think they, 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 they found that they made quite a mistake there. They actually generated antagonism among, by, by, by running this thing down. One example is, for example, they, one of their ways of influencing countries is sort of putting, putting money in cultural things and rebuilding mm. our old mosques that were there that mm. fallen into disrepair. Yeah, um, I mean, sort of educational um, mm. sort of things. One of the things, one of the educational uh, groups is people called Gulen movement. Yeah. Who are now actually who were great friends of mm. Erdogan and now his deadly enemies, mm. and uh, they, they, the Gulen movement uh, had a quite a good press in the West because they were seen as being basically kind of education people interested in education. What's wrong with education? And in fact, they did offer quite a modern education system, and they were uh, they opened schools around the world, and that was all fine as long as Gulen and Erdogan were on good terms with each other. But as soon as they they, they broke apart that became a problem for Turkey. Turkey's going around the world now uh, putting pressure on governments to close down these institutions, which locally are regarded as some favor. This, this is a, a decent education system. It's, it's, it's valid, valued by parents. Gives, gives their kids a good education to make, make it in the modern world. But Turkey's now, now decided it wants to close them down. So all sorts of things that Turkey does are kind of uh, working against itself. But I think that the neo Ottomanism thing has been seen to have failed. It, it got Turkey involved in all sorts of ventures in, in Syria and Iraq, which are now to, uh, gone, gone pear-shaped. I, th I think um, the, the sort of the emphasis on Turkey being a great power, I think that's still true. Turkey still does have a, a, an idea of itself as a, a big major player. But I think they're now drawing their horns in a bit. I think at the moment their big problem is the Kurds. And a lot of things are being driven now by how they're going to deal with the Kurdish issue. And they're, they're forming now temporary alliances with other people. In order to work out, I mean, there's a kind of a Turkish Iraqi Iranian alliance being formed now in following the, the, the Kurdish referendum. But to go back, I, I did mention um, the Serbian visit. That's very interesting. This is only the second time Erdogan has been to the country. And in fact, the last time he was there, the country had a different name. And in a way, he's, it looks like, okay, we're now going to try and overcome the, the bad blood we generated with the Serbian because of our previous policy. Let's go in there, there and um, uh, invest in uh, the economy. He's ending up in Novi Pazar. Mm. So in a way, kind of he's, you know, he's, he's tried to sort of make, make a, a bridge towards Serbia. And then at the same time, he's, he's saying, well, actually, the people I'm really interested in Serbia are the Muslims down in the mm. southwest, where they actually celebrated when he was elected president. I think when the, when the Turkish mm. election was on, they had big screens up in Novi Pazar showing the, the triumphant election in, in Turkey. Um, th these people are, yeah, very, very, very pro-Turkish, but that annoys the rest of Serbia. Yeah. If I can just two very brief points. One, that uh, I agree a lot of uh, points uh, Dr. Taylor made, I think, are quite right. One aspect that hasn't been mentioned so far is, I think, the extremely limited economic uh, capacity of Turkey in the region, which is far more limited even than Russian. I think uh, Albania is the only country there where Turkey is amongst the top foreign trade partners. Kosovo. Every, yeah, and Kosovo. Yeah. Everywhere else it's quite limited. Even Kosovo, I think, has gone down quite a bit. Yeah. Albania is the number three. If we look at investment, even in a country like Bosnia, where there's a predisposition, as we heard, to welcoming Turkey, I think the sum total of Turkish investment is 200 million euro, which is uh, hardly anything. So, and of course, Turkey after suffered greatly after the 2008 crisis and suffered setback to its ability to project itself uh, into the Balkans. So I would emphasize that. The one caveat about the future, about this picture of uh, low or insignificant Turkish influence, depending on how things develop and depending on whether these prophecies of EU doom come about or not, you have a situation in the Balkans, demographically speaking, if you look at the projections 2030, 2040, the amount of people that are Muslims in the region, very, very large number of people that will be looking, I would suspect, to countries like Turkey for cultural, educational, as we heard at the moment, that's all spiked because of the Gulen mm. movement. Mm. But who knows what it'll be like in a decade's time. And no belt, I know you've been waiting. I, I just wanted to follow up on the Muslim import, and in particular the Saudi Wahhabi 
um, who were active, of course, in Novi Pazar and have sent uh, fighters mm. to take part in the atrocities in Iraq. And I wondered if you have any comments on the uh, effect on the local Muslim population of the, the impact, if any, of this more fundamentalist streak. Well, to, in I the would region, say, in particular, to on the young colleague, people. neither to overestimate or underestimate. There have been some European politicians who have been giving alarmist statements on the role of the returning jihadi fighters as the Islamic State is being defeated in places like Syria and Iraq. There's many fighters who are returning to this region. And we're talking about hundreds of people in Bosnia and Kosovo that they could, uh, if not actually carry out attacks in the region itself, they could become a conduit for uh, terrorism uh, elsewhere in Europe. So I wouldn't dismiss this altogether, but at the same time we should keep in mind that there are some politicians that have been trying to make maximum effect on this and maybe exaggerate it a bit. I don't know if other people have. Yeah, I, I, I think with, with the question of Islam in the Balkans, um, these countries had gone through um, decades of uh, living under socialist uh, Yugoslavia, where you know, so um, you had a secular, secularizing push. I think their their regime became quite weak. The difference, the, the different, is Bosnia, that's right. and that's because of the war. That's right. You have a war in 1992-95, that just polarizes things. The Muslims in Bosnia become much more definite. They are Muslims, and you know those people over there, they're Christians and they're our enemies. So, th I, I would, but if you look at Macedonia, Albania, Kosovo, I wouldn't say it's anything like the sort of problem that you've got in Bosnia, where you've got these small communities. They, they well, the these, foreign they, fighters. They're, they're, yeah, the foreign yeah, they fighters. sort of stayed behind yeah. afterwards, and they, they, they go into some village somewhere. Hmm. They're being watched very, very closely. Uh, what you can see is that to the extent that there are terrorist attacks and they're very low level, mm. they're stabbings and shootings, mm. but they have a strong nationalist dimension to them. Uh, they're directed against uh, Serbs who, for example, were prison camp guards mm. during the war, uh, but then they are attacked in a way that you know, resembles a kind of terrorist attack that we might see in Western Europe, the sloganeering, the paraphernalia around it. Does Saudi money play a part? Well, um, it, <laughs> to, to the extent that it promotes a culture which is enabling of radicalization. I think that's true, but I wouldn't want to say more than that. I certainly wouldn't want to go so far as to allege that anyone in Saudi Arabia is actively promoting terrorism uh, in the region. I just don't think the evidence would support that. Um, yeah. Around the tele, if you want. I, if I may, just maybe it would be a, a good way to uh, sum up this sort of part of the uh, discussion. I was surprised this morning to be woken up by receiving an email with a little video of uh, Foreign Minister Dacic singing to uh, President of Turkey mm. at a dinner last night in Turkish. Yes, yes. Uh, so I guess the relationship between Serbia and Turkey is going from strength to strength. But what Except I want to... Except Dacic will use any excuse to sing. Keep well, it <laughs> whatever, but it, it, that's what, what they call cultural diplomacy. Yes. Uh, what I wanted to ask you is, do you think we have spoken about Russia, China, uh, I know we haven't spoken about the United Arab Emirates that has got quite a sizable investment in, mm -hmm. in Serbia for whatever reasons. Do you think that country as small as Serbia can ride, as they say, three horses at the same time and have the relationship with the European Union and leverage all four at the same time, including Turkey? There are five then. Well, they had a great uh, historic feature in Tito, I guess. He rode many horses at the same time. So one shouldn't be surprised, we shouldn't be surprised that small countries aspire to do this, to maximize their limited influence. So I, you know, I wouldn't find that uh, particularly strange. Mm. I mean, well, the, the, the big dichotomy is always between the EU and Russia. Mm. They manage that very well. They, they, they had, when, when, you know, when, when the um, Nikolic was president, he was openly pro-Russian. It didn't seem to stop them, the, the government and the Tadic <coughs> or whoever going, still going to, to Brussels and, and negotiating for a better relationship with the EU. 
Ik weet niet, 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 in a network world, every country has to ride at least, at least two horses, if not three, and if not four. That mm -hmm. is the nature of the network. Mm -hmm. I thought. Now, but let's turn to the United Kingdom's role in all this. Baroness Curry. Thank you. Um, on a recent visit to the region, we spoke to some witnesses who thought that the series of Western Balkan summits that flowed from the Berlin process were important milestones, and to others who thought they were rather less significant, even tokenistic. Uh, I wonder what your assessment of the effectiveness of the Western Balkan Summit is, and in the light of the fact that the UK will be hosting the next one next mm. year, how you think that uh, we can add value to that and put our own mark on it? And in particular, are there any goals of the Western Balkan Summit that might enable us to engage um, China and Turkey as well in the process? I don't know which of you wants to take that. Start. Dr. Les, <laughs> well, I can offer some uh, initial thoughts. Uh, so I think the direct answer to your question is that the, uh, the summit in Trieste was a modest success yeah. on its own terms. And I think the, the, the main achievement was to sustain the, the Berlin process, the rationale of which is to give hope that the Western Balkans will eventually join the EU, even as the process of enlargement remains in abeyance. Uh, and to that extent, I think the EU is probably um, deferring the moment when local politicians switch their attention away from uh, integration with the EU to these unresolved national questions from the 1990s. Mm. Um, but <laughs> all of this has to be seen in the context of what uh, to my mind is an effective end to the process of EU enlargement uh, which you know, derives from the internal crisis in the European Union and a strong feeling among electorates and governments that the EU is not uh, ready to enlarge, uh, particularly into a region um, where you have a number of troubled countries whose problems could only add to the EU's own. And I think this is the strategic context in which the UK has to formulate its Balkan policy post-Brexit. What on earth do you do with countries when the uh, remedy that we've been promoting for the last 20 years, stabilization through integration, appears to have reached a dead end? Uh, and I think you can say that there are probably three ideas in the mix. One is that we just soldier on regardless uh, in the hope that eventually things just come good in the EU and it emerges from its crisis and revives the, pro the uh, policy of enlargement, which indeed is what governments in the region would, would ideally like to happen. Or, as a second option, uh, you could pick up on what indeed was the aim of the Trieste summit, which was to promote a customs union uh, in the Western Balkans. Um, although this did come up against uh, you know, this, in a way, this is probably the best geopolitical option for the region, but it came up against a lot of resistance from mm. countries which saw this as a new Yugoslavia dominated by Serbia. And then I think the third option, uh, which would be a brave stance to take, would be uh, for the UK uh, to try and address what, to my mind, are the underlying structural defects in the region, which is the mismatch of political and ethnic boundaries. Uh, and this would involve backtracking on 25 years of policy in the region. Um, but, you know, potentially the stark policy choice is that unless outsiders are willing, willing to manage a transition to nation states, then the locals will take the initiative <coughs> and pursue it in a way which could be highly <coughs> destabilizing. Of course, that's quite radical. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I can just add one or two things. I think my impression is that the main reaction to Trieste was indeed that it was tokenistic. And one of the reasons why the locals, some of them, uh, resent the emphasis on regionalism, common market, isn't just fear that Serbia would dominate, it's that many of them still cling to the EU enlargement perspective and think this is a big distraction away from that. I mean, one thing, one uh, actor we haven't, I think, mentioned at all is the U.S., and I think that's important also. Yeah, we have 
How do we? Oh, okay. We're coming to the mighty USA. My, my main <laughs> point would be that I guess the elephant in the room here is the lack of clarity or uncertainty of no. what the UK position next year. I mean, next year the UK will still be a member of the EU. And whilst I understand completely the argument made by the colleague here that given UK's limited economic role, the future for the UK is to work in partnership with uh, heavy EU hitters like France and Germany, I understand that perspective. On the other hand, if the UK is genuinely going to exit the European Union, and that still seems in it, I uh, personally do believe that uh, this provides opportunities for new and quite constructive independent approach by the UK to this region. Yeah, that's it. Uh, Lord Grosart, do you want to Well, I, 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 I fear this may open up a, a very wide discussion, but Dr. Less, your comment about uh, the mismatch between um, uh, national loyalties and state loyalties, if you like, um, uh, as, a, as something that, uh, did you say, may be addressed or could be addressed as one of a number of options. Uh, I mean, where does that lead us quite? Well, I think as a first step, it leads towards trying to resolve uh, the dispute in Kosovo, um, which is a disputed territory. Uh, as I'm sure you know, the local Albanian population would like it to be independent, and Serbia refuses to recognize this and still at least formally maintains that it's an integral part of Serbia. And this has been, uh, this issue has been running for, uh, we're since at least 2008, and if not all the way back to 1999. But my, uh, suspicion is that there is a deal to be done over Kosovo uh, in which Serbia recognizes um, the independence in return for um, uh, the northern enclave. Uh, so in other words, it would be, it, it's a deal which would involve the partition of Kosovo uh, with the north returning to Serbia. And that indeed would be a first step towards addressing what I see as this fundamental structural defect in the region, which is the mismatch of political and ethnic boundaries. Where does that leave Bosnia? Uh, Mr. Vujic, the president, told us that he was going to have an internal dialogue on this issue. That's right. But yeah. um, it seemed we're a very long way from suggesting. Well, this is the proposal which uh, Serbia's foreign minister, Ivica Dacic, mm. has put up. Uh, and he received a lot of uh, kickback within Serbia from hardline nationalists who were not willing to make any concessions whatsoever. But of course, uh, perceptions can change if you start to pursue these options a bit more seriously. And it's certainly, I think, the case that both Belgrade and Pristina want to resolve this issue because it's clear that neither of them can have everything they want. And in the meantime, the unresolved status of Kosovo is hurting both of them. Uh, it's paralyzing Serbia's yeah. journey towards the EU, and well, it's paralyzing the whole development of the Kosovo now, state. We, we are going to come back to these yeah. issues again. We're getting a bit internal, but I, I, I do want to move on in our... We just, we've got all your experts here. If we could now just um, uh, look at the NATO angle, Baron Ms. Herring, would you like to ask a question on that? Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll try to be very, very short because I'm sure a lot of people want so to comment. And time. one thing I wanted to ask is there are different feelings towards NATO in different countries of what used to be uh, Yugoslavia. Uh, how do you feel, as experts in this area, is NATO a factor of stability uh, for the region or would further NATO expansion uh, bear negative impact upon it? Would like a shot at that. Would, would Dr. Les, just, just to, to yes. sort of reinforce that, I mean, we've already heard Turkey is in flux over the EU. Is Turkey in flux over NATO as well? Are we beginning to see the formation of a Well, it's, it's different because Turkey is already a member of NATO and there's no suggestion that it's going to leave. Mm. But if you look at the actual political relations, Turkey, uh, Turkey's relations with America are very strained at the moment, yeah, uh, and, and the same with a number of NATO members, yeah. Germany most obviously. There, there's this um, purchase of the Russian S-400 missile, uh, at, 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 uh, ground-to-air missile, 
um, system from Russia, which looks very strange because you have a NATO member which will be using a Russian uh, defense system which mm. interferes with the identification of friend or foe um, that airplanes mm. carry around with them. Of um, course, Turkey in a strategic alliance with Russia. That's very strange for a yeah. NATO member. Well, it, it looks yeah. a bit short-termist because I think, I think the issue in the end came down to where, um, whether there's any kind of co-production going on with, with uh, uh, between the country that whatever country Turkey went to for this new system, what, what sort of deal they would get for them? Because Turkey has its own ambitions to become a major arms arms producer, so it wants to up its its own uh, access to technology. But it does look rather odd. I, I'm I'm seeing from people like Stoltenberg, the NATO Secretary General, kind of a desire to kind of let's kind of brush this under the carpet. Let's not worry too much about. It. Let's try and work around this no. thing. But I thought, from a tactical point of view, um, it's going against interoperability. In, within NATO, it's very, very strange. It's obviously, um, also it helps Turkey in the sense of plowing its own furrow. You know, we don't need, we're not depend so dependent on the West as, as you think we are. Um, and you know, obviously relations have considerably improved since the shooting down of the S the SU-24 um, a couple of years ago. And uh, there's, mm -hmm. there's all sorts of kind of tactical issues where Turkey and uh, Russia uh, work can cooperate to their advantage. But I would, I, would, I would say that Turkey in the end isn't going to, if we're looking at sort of some sort of zero sum game in the old sort of Cold War, this doesn't work in this case. We're not looking at Turkey saying, we're no, no longer friends with the West, I'm now going to be friends with Russia. Turkey wants to go its own way. That's Erdogan's vision, is Turkey as a major Middle Eastern power, beholden neither to the West nor to, nor to Russia. And well, now, um, I want to move on because we've got only a few minutes. The, the other pathway is, of course, the EU itself. Baron Smith. We've already heard um, discussions about Turkey and the EU, and possibly, um, therefore, looking, le leaving Turkey aside for a moment. To what extent do either China or Russia have they expressed concerns about possible Western Balkan accession to the European Union? In particular, We've seen problems with Ukraine's relations with the EU, at least from a Russian perspective. Are there similar concerns about the West, Western Balkans, or do they not really perceive that membership is likely to happen anytime soon? Well, I think in the case of China, the answer is very simple. It wants them to join the EU, uh, and that's because uh, it sees EU membership as absolutely critical to the stability of the region. and. Uh, given that China is pouring a huge amount of money in the region, it doesn't want conflict. Uh, and I think it's probably taking a long-term view also that one day you'll have six friendly pro-Chinese countries in the EU institutions which will lobby for Chinese political interests. In response to the, um, the, Russia, uh, the Russia question, um, for years the Russian approach to the region was that they were obviously against NATO enlargement in the region, but there were signals that... Russia would support enlargement to the European Union. Now, the Ukrainian crisis might have changed these calculations because the Russian rhetoric started to be more antagonistic towards the European Union. Now, I haven't seen clear signals saying from, from, from Moscow in the region saying that Russia opposes uh, enlargement of the EU into the region, but definitely the context changed, the situation might have changed. So I would say that you know, for Russia, it's uh, more of a priority in region to maintain the, um, the status quo and the muddy waters uh, and to take advantage of the current situation there rather than actively pursue or promote European enlargement. I will actually agree with the pre previous um, witness uh, on, on the issue of Chinese support to the European Union perspective of the, of the countries in the region. Uh, they're investing heavily, and they aim to invest heavily, so therefore political stability of this region is, is key to them. However, as we mentioned throughout different interventions here, the kind of engagement, you know, the kind of investment model that they promote actually has negative consequences, including on the EU perspective of those countries. So you have to be very careful about China's approach here. Okay? Uh, it's this approach that China promotes has consequences in terms of furthering corruption, as for example the, was the case in Macedonia, were at the background of the, of the political crisis. We have seen also allegations towards including the highest uh, political officials of, of the former uh, Gruevsky's government about direct dealings with Chinese companies which would amount to transfer of, of Chinese money directly to the bank accounts. We've also seen the effects on, on indebtedness, 
on transparency throughout the region. So we have to be very careful about China's approach on the, on the EU perspective. If I may chip in also on the, on the previous question on the Western Balkan summit um, and, and the UK's potential role there, I think the summit next year will be happening in the context of, uh, from the economic point of view, of two key facts. One, if you see the World Bank's report on the, on the economic perspective of, of the region, it for the first time since a, a number of years, it actually has a positive view. It says that the economic growth is returning to the region. And actually, even in Serbia, after five years of pretty sluggish growth, we have seen a, a pickup in, in the economic growth. Secondly, the key trade and investment partner of the Balkans is and will remain the European Union. And we also see the Eurozone returning to growth. And for the first time, also in many years, it grows faster than other uh, Western economies. Now, this, the next year summit will be happening in this context where the UK, together with the European partners, can actually work on what is a crucial part of the stability in the region, which is the economic growth and, uh, most more crucially, uh, employment opportunities, especially for the youth uh, part of the population. Now here, engaging with all the other external investors in the region will also be very important. You may be complaining about the different investment models of, of China and the negative consequences it has, but China is there to stay. We'd better take this into account and actually make sure that our policies are informed by this reality. Now, my advice would be to engage China, but in a, in a very specific way. We cannot really talk to China directly on the, on, the, on the kind of investment model it has. It will not going to change it because of our diplomatic efforts. What we need to do is firstly agree with the countries in the region that the European Union, European partners, including the United Kingdom, Kingdom, is ready to step up their economic offer if they comply with our high standards. If those high standards are adhered to, we'll be stepping up our, our offer but also we have to agree that those same standards are adhered to when those countries deal with external investors. This is of course not, not easy, especially that we, as we have been discussed, uh, also losing a very uh, important uh, uh, member of the, of, the, of the European Union. But I think UK will still have a very, very important role on this. World Bank and IMF publications tend to be out of date. When we talk about return to growth, keep in mind that first half growth this year in Serbia was the second worst in Europe, only 1%. The worst growth was in Macedonia, where it was negative. So keep in perspective the expectations that they are on to a new bright path. I tend to think that their economic perspectives are rather limited, which is a great complicating factor for the region. It is rather limited, it's certainly the worst. Well, listen, um, we're nearly <laughs> at the end. Um, we haven't mentioned, although it was raised earlier, the United States and Mr. Trump, but obviously they have played a major part in the area. Are they, Doctor Lord Jockley? Yeah, yes. Uh, perhaps you could guide us through the Im rather imponderable uh, situation with regard to United States foreign policy, uh, and, and perhaps tell us how you think it might evolve. I, I realise how difficult it is in the future. And particularly, uh, do you see any softening in the United States position on Russian actions in the region? And finally, uh, can you tell us about how the United States is responding to the actions we've already discussed with regard to Turkey and China in, in the uh, in the Would region? I start? It's a big question. Please. I'll, I'll try and be succinct. Uh, I think the short answer is there is no evolution in American policy, and I'm not anticipating any unless the facts on the ground change so fundamentally that America has to rethink its approach. But this is not a strategic priority for mm -hmm. any senior official in the United States, and I think there's reasonable confidence among the people who are leading the policy that the policy is correct. Uh, and indeed, with a little bit more effort, you can face down these various challenges which are emerging, Russia, Turkey, China, and so on. I think the caveat here, though, is the perception that U.S. has lost interest and withdrawn from the region. Well, quite interesting. On the contrary, on Macedonia, they showed up the EU. It was American intervention that resolved the crisis there. On Montenegro, of course, in the end, it was U.S. assent for Montenegro to join NATO, and Pence made a stirring visit to Podgorica to underline 
that, and even on Bosnia and something like that, the U.S. has been in the forefront of slapping sanctions on Dodik. So the idea that the U.S. is withdrawing from the region is probably not right. I, I think in some said. cases you've still got U.S. officials still, I still in... Sorry, Dr. Taylor. Sorry. Because you, you, you've still got U.S. officials, uh, embassy officials, still in posts because they haven't been replaced. I mean, you know, the Macedonian mm. policy, I mean, mm. uh, the U.S. embassy in Skopje, I think, was a continuation of the, of the Obama policy. Just to mention U.S.-Turkey, enormous problems of, 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 uh, with the U.S.-Turkish relationship. Uh, the Turkish hopes of Trump uh, versing Obama's position on, say, extraditing Gulen uh, have been dashed. Uh, the U.S. is sticking to the idea that the ex whether they extradite Gulen or not is purely a legal issue. There's, uh, there's, there's, there's um, two Turks on trial at the moment in, in America over busting U uh, 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 sanctions on Iran. There's the whole question whether Trump is actually going to go through and, and, uh, and unravel the Iranian uh, deal, which could be, mean, here we are, back to having sanctions on Iran all over again, and that's going to hurt Turkey enormously. Turkey now imports most of its oil from Iran. Yeah, on, the, on the American question, it very much depends on the personnel. Now, there is this sign that President Trump announced his intent to nominate Wes Mitchell to be the Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs. Mm -hmm. This was a post that was vacant. Up until now, it still is, because he wasn't nominated, but he's a, um, he was a co-founder of Center for European Policy Analysis. He is well known throughout the region of Central Europe, but also Southeastern Europe. He is considered the person who understands the dynamics of the region. So to a large extent, I would, I would concur with what uh, Thomas was saying at the very beginning. I wouldn't expect any changes, and the fact that there may be actually a person nominated for dealings uh, with the region may actually increase um, potentially American President's involvement uh, in, in the region. So, but there's no Richard Holbrook on the scene who's going to come back in and bring more. Well, it might. I mean, I, I have to say I'm quite pessimistic about stability in the Balkans, be primarily because uh, the Bosnian Serbs are exploiting this new power vacuum to make a very serious drive at independence. And I think there is a potential for a shake up in the region, perhaps at the end of this decade, start next decade. And in those circumstances, uh, America will probably have to look hard at what it wants from the Balkans and how to achieve it. And at that point, it will need some uh, you know, hard-hitting diplomats uh, you know, to get stuck into to, to the question of how to promote stability in the yeah. long term. Maybe more optimistic, maybe we'll yeah. see if it happens or not. There is a clear date, as it seems, 2025 for the next EU enlargement. I mean, it was repeated by a number of EU officials, including Juncker, including Hahn, including Mogherini, and I believe President of France also mentioned 2025 as a potential date for Serbia and Montenegro maybe joining the EU. So it may it may go to a sort of more crisis situation, but maybe it will. To follow up with your question, that, um, I mean. Uh, to my knowledge, for about 10 years, um, people have been saying that Dayton is, is out of date. Uh, uh, but you're saying maybe at the end of this decade that, that there may be uh, a move to, to have Dayton too. Uh, but I mean, w w they seem to be struggling on, albeit at each other's throats already, uh, but it, it's continuing. Uh, what events might cause uh, a, 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 a catalyst situation for Dayton 2 to be started? I'm not envisaging Dayton 2 because I don't believe the Bosnian Serbs want Dayton 2. They want to leave Bosnia uh, and the leadership of the Bosnian Serbs is becoming ex increasingly ex explicit about the goal of independence. But if you're asking what the preconditions for that are, the Bos Bosnian Serbs, Republic of Serbska is an inherently weak entity with about 1.3 million people, an almost indefensible territory. And so it needs certain things in place before it's going to make a bid for independence. And these include support from Serbia, support from Russia, Western impotence, and ideally, uh, a, a sort of momentum for independence on the part of the Bosnian Croats, backed by Croatia. Right. And it's clear that these elements are not in place yet. 
uh, which is why you're seeing the Bosnian uh, a sort of mismatch between what the Bosnian Serb leadership is saying and what it's actually doing. Mm. Uh, and I think Russia is actually dampening down some of its um, ambitions at the moment because Russia doesn't want a clash with Turkey in the Balkans no, indeed. Uh, I think for, for as long as the Syrian issue is unresolved. That's correct, I think. Mm. And I think, you know, there's things in life that are worse than frozen conflicts. If we look at the example Cyprus, okay, it's not first best solution, but as long as you don't have return to conflict, keeping the lid on, mm. and I don't tend to be a supporter of theories that unless you resolve these issues, it holds you back from economic development. I mean, look at South Korea, Taiwan, they were unresolved uh, uh, territorial issues and they prospered quite nicely. So uh, I don't think it's a necessary condition to resolve. Well, gentlemen, I wanted to end on an optimistic note. I'm not having much success, I <laughs> I thought I was being optimistic. <laughs> but uh, the, 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 you, the trouble is that you all know a great deal more than we've given you time to share with us. And therefore, I feel there's a great unexplored region in your minds. We should have spent a day together rather than a couple of hours. But um, I think for this day, at this point, we will have to call a halt and express our extreme gratitude to you for confirming but more revealing and casting beams of light on the incredibly complex interwoven set of relations that we're dealing with in this area. It looks small, and yet somehow it's very, very big. And it raises all the great issues of a world very much in flux with all the elder alliances becoming fluid and under question. So thank you very much indeed for being with us. We really do appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you.